I'm Ava, and at 23 years old, I am living a somewhat unconventional life. Unlike my peers, I don't hold a full-time job. Ever since my middle school days, I've been rather reclusive. I started high school, but didn't finish, so my formal education ended with middle school. Since then, I've been residing at my parents' house, juggling part-time work and occasionally picking up graphic designer. I have an older brother named Thomas, who is five years my senior. Thomas and I are like night and day, he excels in sports, enjoys a wide circle of friends, and is incredibly sociable, a stark contrast to my more introverted nature. During our younger years, Thomas seemed almost embarrassed by my presence, he never brought friends home, and would outright ignore me if we ever bumped into each other in public places like the local convenience store. It was as if he preferred others not to know we were related. I resigned myself to this situation, treating it like a distant issue that didn't directly affect me. Things changed somewhat when Thomas went off to college. He moved out, and with his departure, I stopped fretting over our strained relationship. Time passed, and soon there were murmurs of Thomas getting married as he approached his 27th birthday, a development that wasn't altogether surprising. Plans were made for him to bring his fiancée to meet our parents. On the day of their visit, I decided to be there, thinking it might be a good opportunity to foster a better connection with my family. The day arrived, and Thomas walked into our house precisely on time. His reaction upon seeing me sitting with our parents was one of brief confusion. His fiancée followed, entering with a polite apology for the intrusion. Her gaze quickly shifted between us, her expression revealing her puzzlement, clearly, Thomas hadn't mentioned me. My parents introduced themselves, conveniently omitting my presence. The fiancé seemed to accept their greeting, although her polite smile carried a hint of confusion. Growing up, comparisons between Thomas and me were constant. Our parents often remarked, if your brother can do it, why can't you? A mantra that echoed throughout our childhood and evolved into more cutting remarks as we grew older. At times, I felt dismissed as nothing more than a burden. It seemed that my parents intended to sideline me during this meeting as well. As my mother rose to fetch more drinks, she whispered sharply, why are you here? Go back to your room. I had joined the gathering hoping to bridge gaps between us, but it seemed to only reinforce the existing divides. Despite the discomfort, I remained seated, not ready to retreat just yet. Thomas's fiancé, introduced as Delilah, shared my age, but exuded an elegance and composure that set her apart. There was an unspoken air about her suggesting that she was not someone to approach lightly. As the meeting progressed, I observed and listened, still hoping to find my place within the family dynamic, even as the challenges persisted. Thomas seemed visibly uncomfortable with my presence at the family meeting. He introduced his fiancé to our parents, yet he completely ignored me, as if I were invisible. The discussions about the wedding concluded, and casual conversation took over, but my brother's demeanor towards me didn't change. At one point, he did ask, Um, what do you usually do, Ava? But before I could respond, he quickly cut me off, telling Delilah, Wait, you don't need to talk to her. Clearly surprised by his remark, Delilah just nodded. My mother then added, that's right, don't worry about it, and my father dismissively referred to me as just a stranger with a blood relation. That moment crystallized something for me, a realization that reconciliation was perhaps never an option. As if my presence was immaterial, the meeting ended, and life moved on. Thomas and Delilah married and began constructing their home. Thomas had landed a job at a prestigious company post-college, and was doing well financially. Delilah decided to become a stay-at-home wife and had already left her job. When their house was completed, they planned a housewarming party with a select guest list that included Delilah's relatives and my brother's superiors. My parents were flustered with excitement, pondering over the appropriate housewarming gift. My father suggested something simple since we were family, but when he glanced at the invitation, only his and my mother's names were listed. My mother, noticing the omission, queried, 
Ava is coming too, right? The question felt ironic, considering how they had previously presented me. Despite the dismissive attitude at the meeting, I initially declined the invitation, but my mother insisted, no, you're coming. I'll make arrangements. Reluctantly, I agreed to go. On the day of the party, it started raining heavily. We took a taxi to my brother's new home. Due to the rain, my brother and Delilah didn't come out to greet us at the front yard, but waited at the entrance. As we arrived, my mother quickly told me, you pay for the taxi, and then she and my father rushed under the limited shelter of the entrance without waiting for me. After paying, I hurried toward the house, soaked from the rain. At the entrance, Delilah greeted me. Her earlier warmth seemed tempered by the formalities of the event, and as I stepped into the warmth of their new home, I pondered the complexities of family dynamics and the distance that sometimes grows not just in miles, but in simple human connections. At the housewarming party, Delilah greeted me with a curious tilt of her head, seemingly unable to place me. Who are you? she asked. Despite having met her once before, it appeared she didn't remember me. I reintroduced myself as Ava, Thomas's sister, hoping to clarify any confusion. However, her response was chillingly dismissive, laced with a smile. Ah, the high school dropout, right? Nate, we didn't invite the parasite living off her parents. Her words, though spoken casually, cut deep. Just then, my brother Thomas walked in, having overheard the exchange. His expression mirrored Delilah's disdain. Huh, why are you here? Hey, I told you not to invite her. Why is she here? He questioned, his tone brimming with irritation. Caught off guard, I stammered, well, I don't know either. It was clear they hadn't intended for me to be part of this gathering. As the reality of their attitude sank in, Delilah's demeanor hardened further, surpassing even the coldness of my brother and parents. Thomas bluntly added, yeah, you're a stranger because of your low education. Actually, not finishing high school doesn't even count as an education, right? Could you please leave the property quickly? Delilah nodded in agreement, her calm expression unchanging and somehow more intimidating. With no further words, I turned and left the party. Outside, the rain poured relentlessly. The taxi from earlier was long gone, and without an umbrella, I found myself walking along the drenched streets, struggling to find another cab. Behind me, I could faintly hear Delilah's laughter echoing, adding insult to injury. Eventually, I made my way home, soaked and disheartened. When my parents returned later, they seemed to have enjoyed themselves and were surprised to see me back so early. Why did you leave suddenly? Couldn't even call a taxi for the way back, you're so useless, my mother scolded as if it were just another one of my failings. Attempting to avoid further conflict, I lied, sorry, I suddenly had a stomach ache. Their response was devoid of sympathy. For such a reason, you left on your own. You're hopeless. Make sure to give the gift later, you're an adult, my father added dismissively. I had indeed prepared a gift for the party, but in the end, I brought it back home with me. I contemplated mailing it, but realized I didn't know their new address. The atmosphere was too strained to ask my parents, so I hesitantly reached out to my brother. I want to send a gift. Can you tell me the address? I texted. His reply was curt and cold, I don't give my address to strangers. I sighed deeply, feeling a mix of amazement and sorrow at the extent of their exclusion. Was it genuinely enjoyable for them to assert their dominance over me, not just privately, but also in front of others? It seemed that the cruelty wasn't limited to Thomas, perhaps Delilah was contributing to these harsh responses as well. Amidst the laughter and casual dismissal at the party, I realized that the disconnect between my family and myself was too vast to bridge. I decided not to send the congratulatory gift I had intended for my brother and his wife's housewarming. Instead, I made a more significant decision to move out and live independently. Despite not having a full-time job, I had managed to save some money from various part-time jobs, which allowed me to rent a small room for myself. 
Living on a tight budget, I turned to video streaming, a hobby I enjoyed and understood well. I was already familiar with the dynamics of popular streams and knew how to garner views. Once I started my own streams, I began earning a decent income, enough to cover my daily expenses and then some. As my earnings increased, I started to invest my surplus funds. These investments paid off, enabling me to start a small business importing and selling goods. Life became busier, but it was a fulfilling kind of busy, without anyone to criticize how I spent my time. Several months into my new life, I received an unexpected call from my parents, who had not been in touch since I moved out. They asked for financial help for Thomas, which piqued my curiosity. What had happened to the brother, who had just built a luxurious new house? My parents explained that Thomas had been hosting frequent gatherings at his home, networking with bosses, executives, clients, and acquaintances of Delilah. During one of these parties, he was persuaded into a dubious investment that promised high returns in a short period. Unfortunately, the investment failed, and Thomas lost a substantial amount of money. I was astonished. Thomas had a stable job that should have been enough. I asked who had introduced him to the investment. It's one of Delilah's acquaintances, they said, still seemingly trusting of Delilah. Curious, I asked how much they needed to bail him out. The amount they mentioned was staggering, far beyond what an average company employee could afford. Doubting the necessity, I probed if that was solely for my brother, and unsurprisingly, it turned out my parents were also caught in the same bad investment. I couldn't help but feel a mix of incredulity and frustration. They hadn't contacted me out of familial love, they only reached out for financial rescue. As they pressed on, claiming the bond of real family should compel me to help, I remembered all the times they had treated me as a stranger. Sorry, but I'm busy, and I'm a stranger to you, right? I responded, echoing their previous dismissals. With that, I ended the call. Somehow, my refusal did not deter them. Later, they found out where I lived, and to my dismay, my parents and Thomas's family showed up at my door. Their persistence was unexpected, but I was prepared to stand my ground, fortified by the independence and resilience I had cultivated in my new life. The encounter occurred at my small business office, where I was deep in a business meeting when my secretary quietly approached, a hint of uncertainty in her voice. There are guests here for you, President. I don't have any other appointments scheduled for you, who could they be, she inquired. Her next words sent a chill down my spine, they claim to be your family. Mm. Apologizing to my business partner, I excused myself and made my way to the reception area. There, I was confronted with the unexpected sight of my pregnant sister-in-law Delilah, my brother, and my parents. My brother's first words dripped with condescension, you're running a company, huh? Well, it's much smaller than where I work. He scanned the office disdainfully. Feigning ignorance, I asked, who are you, which only ignited my brother's temper further. What's with the attitude, he shouted, frustration evident in his voice. My mother quickly interjected, laying bare their intentions without a hint of subtlety. We talked about this before, but we need your support. You're running a company, so you can help us out, right? The way she asked for money, as if entitled to my hard-earned success, was audacious. Delilah joined in, adding a layer of emotional manipulation, yeah, it's an important time for our family. Delilah is about to give birth, and the child's growth isn't good, so we need to see a good doctor. Please, Ava. My father and Delilah pressed on, their words suggesting it was my obligation to shoulder everyone's burdens. The awkwardness of the situation escalated as employees passed by the reception area, throwing concerned glances our way. Wishing to end this uncomfortable confrontation swiftly, I stated firmly, please leave. You're causing a disturbance. This statement threw my brother over the edge. What? We are a disturbance. We came all the way here, and that's how you talk to your family, he yelled, his voice echoing through the office. The commotion halted nearby employees in their tracks. 
My brother, fueled by anger and desperation, attempted to shame me in front of my team. Do you all know? This girl dropped out of middle school. She was a shut-in, no neat. Yet, the response from my employees was not what he expected. They rallied to my defense, their voices firm and supportive. We know, everyone knows the president's background. Me too. The president hires many people from similar situations. Is there a problem? My brother, usually mingling with the educated and affluent, was visibly taken aback, unable to formulate a coherent response. Meanwhile, my father scoffed, what a pathetic company, just a gathering of needs. My brother echoed his disdain, exactly, companies that do business with. But their words faded into the background. Their attempt to demean me and my employees, people who had faced various challenges yet strived for better, only strengthened our resolve. In that moment, I realized that the values and resilience we shared as a team were far stronger than the shallow judgments passed by my estranged family. Their attempt to belittle us had failed, reinforcing my decision to maintain my distance and continue building a supportive and inclusive business environment. At that heated moment, the president of the company I had been meeting with, who had been waiting in the adjacent room, stepped into the reception area, drawn by the commotion. My brother Thomas, who had been loudly disparaging my company, turned pale upon seeing the president. His attempt to maintain some dignity failed as Delilah, unaware of who had joined us, inquired aloud, what's wrong, Thomas? Idiot, don't say my name, my brother hissed at Delilah, but the damage was done. Thomas? Oh, it's you, the president exclaimed, recognizing my brother. He approached Thomas confidently and addressed him, you're the guy who handles Mr. Long's account, the facilities manager, right? We owe a lot to your company. It turned out that my brother's company was a client of the very person he had just insulted by association with me. Sweating profusely, my brother stumbled over his words, ah, uh, um, that's, oh, I guess I'm not memorable since we are not a decent company. His attempt at backpedaling only made his situation worse, and he was visibly shaken as the president threw his own derogatory words back at him. My parents and Delilah also recognized the gravity of the situation and fell silent, sensing the awkwardness escalating. I turned to the president and apologized again for the disruption. I'm sorry for taking up your valuable time. I'll ask them to leave. But the president, perhaps sensing the tension and wanting to ensure things remain civil, offered, oh, are you sure? I have time today, so I don't mind waiting. You can prioritize talking with your family. Decisively, I responded, no, they are not my family, casting a firm glance at my parents and brother's family. They are complete strangers. Following this exchange, my family was escorted out of the company. The presence of the company president perhaps shocked them into silence, and they left without further incident. Curious about how my professional life came to light, I later discovered that Delilah was behind it. She had a well-informed friend who kept up with investment news. This friend had come across media coverage featuring a young woman in her 20s who was making waves as a skilled trader and business owner, me. Delilah was shocked to realize that this competent individual was the same person her husband had described as a middle school dropout and a shut-in. She shared this discovery with my brother and parents, prompting them to see me not as the family outcast, but as a potential financial resource. This revelation explained the sudden interest in my life, but by then, I had already established my boundaries and chosen to distance myself from their manipulative tactics. Since the day I declined to give my family financial assistance, they started reaching out more frequently. However, I was often busy and didn't respond to their calls, and after their direct request for money, I chose not to return their calls either. Unwilling to accept this, they took the drastic step of coming to my company. Having resolved to treat them like strangers, I maintained my distance, but curiosity about I Delilah and her connections led me to delve a bit deeper. It turned out that Delilah's so-called friend, who was deeply involved in my family's financial misadventures, was actually her ex-boyfriend. More shockingly, 
I discovered that Delilah was still romantically involved with him, and that the child she was carrying was not my brother's, but her ex-boyfriend's, who was also an investor. Understandably, this revelation devastated my brother. The entire foundation of his relationship with Delilah was built on deception. It emerged that she, guided by her ex-boyfriend, had been siphoning money from multiple men. The situation escalated until Delilah and her ex-boyfriend were taken into police custody, though the money they had swindled was unlikely to be recovered soon. The fallout from these revelations rippled through my family. My brother's professional reputation suffered greatly after the incident at my company, leading to his relegation to a less influential position within his company, often derisively called a windowside department. Unable to cope with the mounting stress and humiliation, he eventually resigned. My father also faced severe repercussions. His unprofessional behavior at work came to light when he lost his temper with a subcontractor in the presence of his company's president. An investigation into his conduct revealed a pattern of derogatory remarks about the educational attainment of his colleagues, mirroring the disdain he had often shown towards me. This ultimately led to his dismissal. Despite both my brother and father losing their jobs, they, along with my mother, still attempted to contact me, proposing that we all live together. I had already taken measures to ensure they could not force their way into my building or disrupt my business again. Their latest entreaties often ended with, we are still family, right? But their previous actions had shown that their concept of family was conditional and self-serving. My response remained consistent and firm, I don't know you. You're complete strangers to me. I have firmly decided that this will continue to be my stance in the future, preserving my peace and focusing on my own life and business without their disruptive influence.